You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. Boys are back in town. <laughs> Josh, it's good to be back. New Zealand changed me. Yeah, New Zealand definitely changed you. You look good. Thanks. Are you going to do the whole episode like that? Uh, no. Oh my gosh. Puppeteering is way harder than it seems. All right, give me a second. Okay. Ugh. 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 All right, I'm back. <laughs> ah, good, good, good. Well, we missed you. <laughs> ah, thanks so much. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the Command Zone Podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Quiet. I was hoping you were going to do the puppet thing the whole time. Oh, yeah. You need Jimmy old gold Jimmy puppet Jimmy Muppet boy Jimmy. I believe <laughs> that uh, some congratulations are in order. Thank you. And Thank you. Uh, as well as just let me speak for everyone out there saying we're very happy to see you again. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, it's, it's very nice to be back as well. I got to keep up with Game Nights while I was away. Listen to some episodes of the podcast. Can't stand that DJ guy. I'm just kidding. <laughs> DJ is oh, great. Go. DJ is great. Uh, can't stand the comments that are like, Jimmy sucks. DJ rocks. I'm like, but I, the, why can't we have both? Why can't they just say, I like that? End of sentence. <laughs> Everybody's got to, they got to get mean with it. That's expecting quite a lot. Um, yeah. But it's really great to be back, obviously, uh, six months away from the channel. Well, I had a little break in between, but, uh, you know, six you, months. You visited us in the middle. That yeah. was nice. Yeah. Six months, though, is a long time, and I'm, I'm just happy to be here uh, back in the old set. We recorded a Game Nights episode. Are we allowed to say that? Yeah, we're allowed to say it. Okay, we record it. can't say it. anything else, but we record it. They know DJ's on it. And maybe me. I mean, that would be weird, right? If we like waited until the moment you got back to shoot game nights, and then we're like, never mind. We don't need you, Jimmy. Yeah, we don't need <laughs> you. You're probably out of practice. I don't know if you're fit for this show anymore. Yeah, we don't want you to just get stomped in the game. Yeah, that would be awful. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, today, you know, I've been gone for so long, I've had a lot of time to think about Commander, but also more importantly, you know, working on set with someone for six months, you become their family. And you get to know them because you're working and you're seeing them every single day. You're training together, you're on set together, you're you know practicing lines and doing all that stuff together. And a lot of that, uh, you know, you start, you, the, you, the trajectory is you get to know someone. Hey, nice to meet you. So cool. Oh, what do you like to do? Blah, blah. You know, it's a very nice jovial. You're in the honeymoon period. You're in the honeymoon period. And then you start working with them a little more. There are little things here and they're like, oh, man, this is happening again. Oh, he's like this, blah, blah, blah. And then you get to hating them a little bit, but then you get back to loving them because you have no choice but to be with them every single day. And they really do become like family at the end of it. Um, and so a lot of that also I started tying into like, you know, group dynamics in general. You get to sit and think about like, everyone has their own place at the table and they all fulfill different things that they are and all that. And it got to me to thinking about a question that we always get, which is people have problems with their play groups. And in a lot of ways, a play group is like a family of sorts. Um, you're forced to sit around the table with four of them, and I guess the only way you get rid of them is by taking them out of the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do have a little bit better option than maybe in real life. But that is interesting, especially since you guys were in another country. Yes. It's like, really it's isolated. not like people are going to their own homes and their own friends and family on the weekend or something. Mm -hmm. Like, you guys only know each other there, basically. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. And play groups can be really insular like that, where it's the same group of however many people week after week after week. And yeah. Yeah, that group dynamic. This is just one of the hallmarks of our show always, right? It's like interpreting or learning lessons in life and applying them to the game or learning lessons in the game and applying, applying them to, to life. life. So. That's right. But before we get into all that... We need to talk about our sponsors. Yes. If you go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone to order your magic products, your singles, anything at all, you really are helping out all of our content. That's game nights. That's this podcast. That's extra turns. Anything we do, if you order your cards using that affiliate link, you are directly helping us to produce that stuff. And we super Absolutely. appreciate it. Also, I don't know what time this is coming out. It's probably really close to the holidays. If you need last minute gifts, oh, yeah. Card Kingdom ships super fast. So they might be one of the few places where you could actually get the gift there in time for Christmas. Yeah, definitely a huge holiday rush as always. And hey, while you're there, while you're at your LGS, go check out Ultra Pro Products. They also sponsor this show. Obviously, I mean, they've been working with us for so long. They made these amazing playmats that are in front of us right now, as well as provide all of the sleeves, deck boxes, and you know, equipment you need to make your game better. And to show off at the table so your family goes, ooh, that's cool. Yeah, that's true. And to protect your cards so that, you know, your brother doesn't accidentally spill something on, yeah. you know, Whoops. your masterpiece and ruin it. Whoops. That's never happened to me. I hope I didn't just jinx it. 
Uh, <laughs> and the final way to support the show is, uh, is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. In fact, we call out one lucky patron every single episode, and this episode is dedicated to Max Wooger. Max. Woo. You rock. Gur. Max um, has no- an umlaut. Yeah, an umlaut over the O. I think it's O. 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 I tried, but I'm not good with those, so Ruger. I apologize, Ruger. Max. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> never said your name eight times. <laughs> um, also, there's a level on Patreon, just so you guys didn't know, where we interact with people on our own private Discord server. Oh, yeah. Josh and I have pledged to be much more active on it now. We've had a ton of really interesting discussions over the past few days. So if you subscribe to our Patreon at that tier, you get to have sort of one-on-one conversations with us. Uh, or in the group setting, there's tons of other people there to ask questions from, get spell center support. So just one of the main benefits of using Patreon. Somebody else who is also a patron of the show and so is in the Discord from time to time is DJ. So if you miss DJ, you can talk to him on our Discord server. Also, we tend to spoil little things. I let people see the thumbnail for extra turns like a few days beforehand. And we like to show some stuff off on Discord. And answer questions. Yeah, and if you're a patron and you're not on Discord, you should get on there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, time for the main topic. Yes, one of the most common questions that we get over email, Twitter, Discord, Patreon relates to people's play groups. And it usually is a, breaks down to a couple of main questions, but we often talk about politics at the table, how you can use that to get an advantage. But sometimes we don't, you know, we don't dive as deeply into the interpersonal relationships that exist between people. And, you know, we always say, you know, it's just a game, leave it at the table. But if you sit down with friends you've known for 10 plus years, sometimes it's really hard to leave it at the table Or sometimes someone just does something that irks you the wrong way, or it's been something that's been happening for a while. It's that guy, quote unquote, you know, at your game store that you just can't stand. So we're gonna talk about how to deal with those issues today and keep things fun and to build a better play group in the long run. Um, So we'll break down some common situations and our general advice for how to deal with these situations. So you don't walk away hating your play group or have them hating you, Uh uh-oh. Yeah, it can go both ways. Or like dreading playing, you know, you wanna look forward to playing, Mm -hmm. so yeah. All right, so let's start with, I think the most common thing that we get is one player or one deck is ruining it all and it's making the game unfun for other people. So there's one or more players who might be too competitive or has built a Tau Run deck that all they wanna do is counterspell stuff. They take the game a little more seriously than maybe you want to, or they build a deck that's oppressive, has win conditions with stacks, resource denial, mass land destruction, just endless counterspells, oof. Or just more powerful combos out earlier. They have the more expensive cards can be a thing. Yeah, Yeah. we hear from both sides of this a lot. The people in the playgroup complaining about that player and that player often complaining about their playgroup like... Singling them out. Singling them out and killing them first every time. Yeah. Yeah, this is a dynamic that's very common, but it also causes a lot of frustration. You know it's bad when it's frustration from both sides of the equation, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. As in it's it's so common that it happens all the time. Yeah. Um, Now, we do talk about politics a lot, and this is usually my go-to response. You know, where there's a will, there's a way. There's one player that's just too dominant. You're in a four-player game, a five-player game. You can team up against those people. You can threat assess correctly, tell everyone, hey, look, this is exactly how this person won last time. We should do something about it. And oftentimes, that can be enough to overcome someone with even a very powerful deck compared to the rest of the table. But this isn't necessarily about politics. There's also a lot of other things that you could do, including dun-dun-dun, Talking to the player. <laughs> it's anticlimactic. It is anticlimactic, but it's also very, I mean, it's hard. Yeah. It's. A, I mean, I can't even count the number of times on my, like in one hand where I've gone to Josh and I'm like, hey, Josh, this has sort of been bugging me. Can we talk about it? Because it's just not It's a tough thing to do. Humans don't like doing it. It's confrontation. Yeah. It's awkward. And someone's feelings might get hurt. People might get aggravated. Ugh, it's just tough. But it's important because... You can ask them like, hey, are there other ways that you want to play this game? Because maybe it's not working for the table. Me and the guys, we're all talking about it and it's just making it unfun for us. And we still want to play with you, but we don't want to play in a way that makes us not want to play the game anymore. Ugh. Yeah, it's really tough. Um, you know, the, I think when you get to the point where you almost don't want to invite that person anymore. Yeah. That's the point that you need to talk to them and at least let them know what's going on. I think a lot of people to avoid confrontation will just be like, Just stop calling them to come play. Yeah. And then they get cut out of the loop with no chance to have made any sort of changes. Yeah, exactly. You almost like owe it to the person, especially if they're a good friend that's been playing with you for a long time, to be like, hey, listen, I just want to fill you in on something here. Mm -hmm. And it's nothing personal, but the deck you're playing, we're not having fun against it to the point where like, we kind of don't want to invite you anymore. And that's, I feel bad saying that. I feel bad saying that for the hypothetical situation. No, I mean, I would say I feel bad saying that to them, you know, but that's, that's how, that I just want to let you know how we're feeling and that's not good for anybody. Yeah. So what can we do here? Because, you know, it feels like, you know, 
we just really don't like that deck or you know that what play style or or <clears throat> it's just shutting us out i think that's the most important part of it though which is what can we do next yeah instead of just being like here's the problem bye yeah because that doesn't really give someone the opportunity to quote unquote redeem themselves and the other thing too is that it's a matter of sensitivity and stuff too, where it's like, what if the other person doesn't feel like they need to change or they feel like, no, why don't you rise to my level instead? And that's a really tough situation to deal with. Um, one thing I've been recommending to people is why not try loaning out your decks to other people mm -hmm. if they're around the same power level and being like, hey, look, let's play some games. And look, you've won with this deck so many times. How about trying something else out and just for the sake of everyone else, you know? And if you don't want to, that's totally fine, but it is the sort of thing that makes us not want to play with you as much. And I think people, for the most part, will be pretty reasonable about that. Different play style, different deck build. Or, you know, it depends on how your group is set up. It could be like, hey, listen, I'm not saying never play that deck again. How about don't play it every game? Yeah. You know? How about like, yeah, once per night. Yeah. And we'll all gang up and try to kill you. And your deck's so good, maybe it still wins. Be but a then, fun arch enemy. Yeah, variant. we'll do that once in a while. But if you're just going to play it game after game, that gets kind of boring. Yeah. So maybe we don't do that. I also want to caution people on the other side of it because there's this self-righteousness that happens like one party is wrong and one party is right but yeah. in this equation neither party is necessarily wrong or right <laughs> it's just if you can't find a place to meet with the other players yeah. then maybe you shouldn't be in the play same play group that doesn't mean that like the person playing the powerful deck is necessarily wrong mm -hmm. you know and we get a lot of complaints where like people are like well how can i tell them to build better decks I mean, you could try, but if they're still not going to do it, then at a certain point, you've got a choice to make. Yeah. Are you going to play less powerful decks or are you not going to play with them? And yeah. from the other side, how can I build, you know, how can I tell them to play less powerful decks? Well, you can be on the other side of the, that equation. And I think sometimes it's fine. Not all marriages work. Sometimes you're just like, okay, we need to walk, go our separate ways. If you're in a place and that's not an option, like you don't have a lot of people to play with, then you're in a situation where you're more likely to have to compromise yeah. both sides again. So compromise is king here. Indeed. And house rules, like you said, is a great way to do it. All right, no one's allowed to play a control deck two games in a row. Maybe tonight each deck needs to be within a power point of each other. You know how we sit down and say, my deck's like a 7 out of 10? You can't go into a 7 out of 10 game with a 10 out of 10. Maybe everyone has to be between 6 and 8 if someone sets the meeting at it's 7. It's tough, though, because if the person really I wants know. to, they can just lie. Yeah, that's true. And then everybody else, you get into an argument where like, you said 7, but that thing's a 9. <laughs> and... I think a play group has other problems if the player just starts lying about yeah. the power level of the well, deck. Well, I mean, if they're already being talked to and they're unwilling to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I think... Or you could have like a, let's do a budget deck. Everybody's got a budget deck and, you know, we'll play yeah. that de those decks against each other once per night or, you know, some some stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. But I, again, the big takeaway for me is definitely, like you said, compromise. Talk to the person. Have the other person talk to you. Don't come at it from a I'm right, you're wrong perspective yeah. because there are a million different ways to play this format from very competitive to the most casual popper decks in the world. Yeah. Nobody's right. Nobody's wrong. They're trying to... It's all best ice cream. It's all favorite ice cream flavor, as I like to say. Like Jimmy, Vanilla. Jimmy's favorite ice cream is vanilla. It's really stupid for me to say, Jimmy, you're wrong. How oh. can he be wrong about his favorite ice cream flavor? He can't. So that's a dumb argument to be in. And sometimes... I'm wrong? You have to realize when you're in a best ice cream flavor argument. But wait, do you like Neapolitan? Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. There's it's not a my nice... favorite, but I like it. It's not my favorite either because well, I'd rather cream. just have vanilla. Yeah. But now at least we can have a low selection. There's the compromise. Yeah, there you go. But don't take any of my vanilla. All right. <laughs> Another issue. Are you going to just eat the vanilla <laughs> part of the Neapolitan? <laughs> well, I like strawberry's second most favorite, so I'll eat that part next. Okay. So you get half of that. You can have chocolate strawberries. Is that sure, good? Sure, sure. Right, I see. This Look at that. Like good... yeah. yeah. Although I kind of controlled that. So I'm sorry. If you have suggestions on how you would like to split it, we can I just kind of like ice cream, so I'm good with whatever. As long as I get an equal amount, I'm cool. Yeah, we can make that okay. happen. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, another issue we kind of brought up is money imbalance. So certain players, and I think our group is kind of guilty of this sometimes. Well, you know, like, hey, check it out. I now have a guy's cradle for all my green decks. Or like, hey, you know, I'm going to use this proxy system so that I only need to buy one tabernacle, but now it can be in any deck I want. Um, and certain players can spend more money on cards just due to their situation. And those that can't afford it sometimes it really does un imbalance some of the parts of the power level. Um, so there, I think it's really hard to have everybody in the play group be on the exact same level as far as like amount of money they have available to spend. Like, yeah. And willing to spend too. Yeah. That, yeah, that they're okay spending on magic, right? Yeah. If you just get five random people off the street and said like, how, what would be your budget for X? It's, 
it's just going to be different. Like people are just different. There are different phases in their life. They have different things going on. Mm -hmm. And so expecting it to be flat is not realistic. No. But again, you want to keep it within reason because it can feel really bad when one person is just... Yeah, if they're dropping tabernacles and stuff, that is, or moats, you know, cards that are really oppressive and are hard to deal with, that can be really poopy. So I think a system where, it, look, if one person is going to decide to go ham, maybe you could say, hey, look, now proxies are allowed, you know, or at least you're allowed to do something like maybe the Canadian Highlander system where you can have a total price point, you know, points per cards or whatever. Oh, Either so way, <laughs> I, it's really confusing. Either way, it's definitely something that has to be discussed um, because I, I have had some really feel bad games where it's like, this is my fun deck and I just get crushed by cards that I know that I don't own or could ever want to own or want to even reasonably get. I'd rather get five of this. You than have one most of cards that. though. I do have most I cards. I rarely see a card where I'm like, oh, the price point of that card matters. Well, Tabernacle may be the only one now that I think about it. Even when Craig plays that, I'm just like, whatever, strip mine it. <laughs> go, go on about my life. Like, yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't run into this in a long time, but I remember when I was a kid, we had our first play group and there was one person in our group that he had a job he was just a year older than the rest of us had a job that was enough yeah yeah because we're like 15 to 17 years old but he worked at the grocery store mm -hmm. so his ability to buy cards was so much greater than the rest of us that his decks were always just generally better and it felt a little bit bad i totally get it like it just felt like oh how can i beat this guy because he's yeah. gonna be able to get you know four royal assassins for his deck and i have to <laughs> <laughs> that's what he had and i have to like i'm lucky that i even have one i just happen to open it in a pack and that card's crazy it's unbeatable yeah. um but i think the commander's brew guys would say and they're the budget guys mm -hmm. that you know you don't need money to even things out because i've played with those guys a True. few times and it doesn't feel like any of andy's decks can't hang with the other decks yeah and, and strip mine is a great example it's a card that everyone has access to and gets it's a little spendy, of problematic but, yeah. cards in the world yeah but I mean, you can find the equivalent. Yeah. So I think we said this many times, right? If somebody else is spending money, you can't expect to equal them by spending nothing, right? Mm -hmm. You have to spend something. And that something might be time. You might have to spend more time watching content. Researching. Researching, going on EDH Brilliant. rec. Yeah, exactly. You might trade. And it's like, haha, you, you spent a bunch of money. But then I learned about some cards that you've never heard of. And I used those. And that was way cheaper. Yeah. Because I spent my time to figure out how to beat your deck. That definitely is a, very, a more satisfying way, I think, to win. And, and the thing about money is that this is probably one of the touchiest subjects in general for human-to-human -human interaction. It's something that our world sort of revolves around. And as a result, someone having more or less of it ends up being something that's really hard to discuss sometimes. So these are all really tricky situations, but I like what Josh said. You know, I like the fact that you can use your own wit and brains and play power and politics to get around these situations. But if it really is becoming oppressive, and I'm not saying this, I think most people that play this game are between the ages of like 21 to 34, maybe older. Like I think it's around that age where people have jobs and people have the ability to have a little a bit of expendable income. But I know a lot of younger players may not be in that situation. So again, it's, it's something to definitely handle delicately. And at the end of the day, I think if you just honestly go up to someone and be like, hey, this is becoming a problem and it's not it's making it unfun for me. Not saying it's your fault necessarily, not putting any blame on the other person, but just saying this is the situation, this is my reality, and this is what's happening. I think it's going to be very hard for people to be sympathetic, to not be sympathetic or empathetic towards, your, towards that because I think we've all been in that position before. Well, I think this is one where you don't even have to necessarily go full confrontation. You could be like, hey, what if we mm -hmm. did a budget? Like we just said... You know, X number of dollars per deck kind of Or thing. no card in the deck can be more than $2 or whatever, you, however you want to Sort of like our top it. 10 lists. Right, and the person with the big budget, if they're like, well, I can't play my whatever, and you could say like, well, what? Are you only good because you play Guy's Cradle in your <laughs> deck or can you build a deck, uh, you know, when there are some different restrictions on the line? Yeah. Let's see what you got. Growing rights of it, Lamar. Yeah. Do you want to just beat up on me because you have Force of Will and I don't? Why don't we try this? Let's see who's, you know. Yeah put it as a challenge to them like throw a card on the ground and be like <laughs> i challenge you to a duel with all cards under 25 dollars. i think people would be up for that challenge and and but here's the thing in both cases i don't think you could say somebody never play that powerful deck again mm -hmm. never play that expensive deck again that's like saying to somebody you know it's like your health kick i always say like i always want like a cheat meal in there because i don't want to say to myself right. i can never eat french fries again in my life that's oh. just impossible but i can be like uh, i can only have french fries once you know a week a week that's doable mm-hmm you know, I can and still, still look altogether to together too many French fries, Josh. How many French fries are you eat each week? Come on now. Yeah, I haven't had a French fry in a little <laughs> while here, but I, I really want some because they're good. Yeah, now just thinking about it makes me want it too. <laughs>
<laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Um, <laughs> we'll get that baby face back before we know it. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, oh, I forgot to throw this. In. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's been a... Man, you're like DJ. He couldn't get it off the table. Really? Every time he threw it, it just landed back on the table. Okay. Okay, back to what we were talking about earlier, which is maybe someone else's problem. But something that we do have to honestly ask ourselves sometimes is, am I the problem? And it's definitely one of the harder questions to pose because it's very introspective and it requires you to be very truthful uh, and honest. And sometimes it's not you that hates the play group. It's the play group that is learning to not have fun when you are playing. I like how diplomatically you put that. Yeah. Sometimes it's the play group that hates you. But sometimes... Hate's it's, a strong word. But hate is a strong word. Sometimes it's the play group that's annoyed with you. Annoyed, yeah. And that's the thing. It's all scales, right? At first, it's maybe mild, mildly irritated. Like when I first, you know, the, after the honeymoon phase, you're like, oh, gosh, he doesn't, he doesn't close his mouth when he chews. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, it's whatever. It's not a big deal. And it's like, oh, my gosh, he hasn't paid me back for lunch. And it's been three weeks, and I've been reminding him every day. And, you know, it starts ramping up into the point where you don't want it ever to get to hate. Because that's just not beneficial or productive for anyone. Um, but I think it's really important if you feel that this may be you or maybe they've had the conversation with you already, really assess the situation, I think, and talk to the players around you and not just the person that came up to you. You know, maybe it is important to hear from other people in the group, uh, other people that may know you better or may, you know, I think some people are much better at having these conversations, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't talk to as many people as possible because just the general communication will help make things more clear. And in general, I think, and we found this all the time on set, whereas something would be said, one person would hear it, it would telephone to the other people, and it would create a kerfluffle of anger or activity about drama. What was said. Yeah, drama from that person. And if that person that was affected just skipped the middleman and went straight to the person that had the original issue, it was way simpler almost every single time and would very quickly resolve it. And it was like, you know what, there is no bad blood here. It's just it's, this thing is bothering me, and now we can work around it. And then the other person sometimes gonna be like, oh, you know what? This is actually kind of bothering me too. And then things just get better the more you talk to everyone else. The more it's brought out into the open. Yeah. And like working together is much better than just like having a grudge against one person, flashing it back, and then like, you know, never playing with that person again. You, yeah. Because when you flash back a spell, you have to exile it. Out yeah. Of yeah. And that goes, yeah. there goes that friendship. You yeah. just exile the friendship. <laughs> Who would do such a thing? <laughs> um, like another easy way to tell if you're the problem is like people always target you yes. for no reason. And that, and some people have a problem where it's like, I did one wrong thing once and now everyone comes at me every single time. No, that's not what happened. I can guarantee it. Yeah, you some... didn't do one wrong thing once. once. If you're being honest about it, you did something a lot. Because yeah. people don't just go to DEF CON 4 from zero. They, they move up the ladder slowly mm -hmm. and you weren't paying attention to all the warning signs along the way. And by the time that DEF CON 4 was hit and they were like, kill on site every time without questions, you built that. Yeah, and unless you're playing with like psychopaths, like prof. <laughs> <laughs> in which case it's like this grudge never even happened and he's just doing all this he to me but that's a very rare situation sorry prof i love you you're not a psychopath um yeah and i think you know i wrote down take responsibility uh-huh which is like a big part of this process because we he that i would say if there was any type of email we get the number one you know uh, mm -hmm. question about it's that it's i'm in my play group and they're killing me first every time and i can't get them to stop and those people always word it in a way where it's almost like I did nothing wrong and I can't believe this is happening. Yeah. I mean, you could just read between the lines in a lot of them. I don't think we've ever received one that goes, I know I did this for a long time and I know why. <laughs> and nobody's ever said that. Because why would they write the email at that point, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm always like, listen, you have to you have to really take a good look in the mirror and be like, there's a reason they're doing this. And it isn't because they just naturally don't like you because they just wouldn't invite you to play. Yeah. Right? It has to do with stuff you've been doing for a long period of time that got them to this point. Yeah. And if you want to fix it, you have to understand that it's going to take a long period of time to fix it. And a lot of, you know, fixing it is going to be you making amends. And that could be like playing different styles of decks. But that doesn't mean like, hey, I played a weak deck once tonight. Right. That doesn't do anything. You yeah. have to play a weak deck and not care about winning maybe and just take your lumps for like maybe weeks, maybe months. It depends on how bad it got, but you have to be willing to like balance out the scales here. Yeah. And the the far better way to handle this is to notice the warning signs beforehand. Yeah. Well, before they get to the point where they're killing you on site. And you'll yeah. notice cuz there'll be a lot of sighing, a lot of grumpiness, 
a lot of like eye rolling. Oh, that deck again. Oh, you win with it. People will make little comments. If you don't pick up, if your radar, if somebody says, oh yeah, oh, I bet you're going to win with Lab Man again, aren't you? Oh, if they cool. say stuff like that, stop playing that deck. Stop winning that way. Don't do that for a while because otherwise you're getting to the point where eventually they're going to kill you first every time and not ask questions. Yeah, that's true. And you know, I don't like this comparison that much, but if you're addicted to something in real life, um, and actually French fries. My, French fries, alcohol, drugs, and you're like, I've been clean for a week. That doesn't, it's great, wonderful. I'm glad you're on the path to changing and helping and healing yourself, but that's not where the actual change kicks in. That's not where other people look at you and go, he did it, you're fine now. Yeah. You know, it, and it's just like real life, changing a behavior isn't as easy as just doing, not doing it for a small period of time. You really have to show people before they can take your words for their worth. Before you get credit for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and like you said, swallowing your pride, very important because, you know, we've seen a lot of people have to apologize for a lot of things recently. And the worst apologies are the ones that basically do the, but I did nothing wrong, it's their fault. Yeah. The, Best apologies are literally saying, I'm sorry, how can we make this better moving forward? I'm sorry, I was wrong. I totally just messed up and I'm, uh, you know, I have no excuse. I won't do it again. Yeah, don't put but in that sentence. Yep. Because my goodness. Everybody wants to though. Everyone they, wants to. They want to say, but that's not who I am. Yeah. But I was under a lot of stress at that time, but blah, blah, blah. No, you take 100% full responsibility for it that's how you're gonna move past it. Even if deep down you're still like, but it wasn't my fault, You, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make anything better. Maybe you and your pride feel a little like less hurt from it, but as a human, I would say that doesn't make you a better person in the long run either. But I'll even say that you can't expect an apology to fix some of these situations. You yeah. also have to demonstrate change, and a lot of that will be like, yeah, not playing your Mizzix counter everything deck. Yeah. You know, maybe not playing it for a long, long time. Maybe taking it apart. Yeah. I mean, it just depends. But if you want them to not kill you anymore first, that might be what it, what it takes. And it starts with taking responsibility, swallowing your pride, and figuring out how to move forward and be a different person to make things better. The other way to go, though, too, and I, I would say because along the, um, the philosophy of no one's wrong here, you're not necessarily wrong. I mean, I, I think what you're wrong of in that case is not playing to the level of the table. But mm -hmm. if you're like, hey, listen, I just want to play competitive EDH, then your other option is like, I'm going to take my decks. I'm going to find people who want to play like that. But play it's that way, obviously yeah. not you guys. And that's fine. That's totally fine. You can keep playing how you want to play because you like vanilla. And me sitting here telling you, you should like pistachio is stupid. How am I going to make Jimmy like pistachio ice cream if he doesn't like it? He likes vanilla. It's, it's disgusting, actually. <laughs> it's dumb for me to try and convince him at a certain point, but I like this kind of ice cream, so I'm going to go find people who like that. Yeah. And that doesn't mean, because you don't look down on all people who like a certain flavor of ice cream, because that's just dumb. They just have a certain taste. That's yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Someone likes a TV show you don't like? Why are you offended? <laughs> What's the what's wrong? Oh, I'm sorry. I like watching TVs with a laugh track because I don't know when to laugh sometimes. <laughs> That's now. Now. Oh, laugh track. <laughs> laugh now. <laughs> um, and just like Josh said, one of the next things we want to talk about, changing it up. Um, you know, if the differences are too strong or if you don't want to accommodate it, you know, because I've seen a lot of people be like, I play CEDH, but I have four decks that are super casual and really fun to bring out at GPs or conventions or whatever. You you know, most areas have different local game stores. There's not always only one. There's a lot of other players who are potentially out there. I know Reddit and forums and online areas are great places to find other play groups because they'll be like looking for players or like, hey, we assemble a monthly thing. We want to do this here in Minnesota. You know, is anyone interested in playing this kind of a uh, popper EDH or whatever? So use the resources around you. Google is a great thing to use. Search engines, pretty much everything. You can find everything you want to. Our Discord server, maybe. Our Discord server, yeah, another great place right there. I mean, there's a lot of people right now, they're, they're saying, well, I live in a small town and there's only four people I know that play Magic. So if I'm not going to play with them, I don't have that option, guys. And that's true, which means you have to compromise. Yeah, yeah. Some <laughs> That is a bit of a bummer because, I mean, we're in L.A. It's a huge city. There's a lot of different things to do out here and people to play with. But if you're in the middle of nowhere and, and it's cold and snowy and you, it's hard enough to make it two miles out to your friend's house because there's a blizzard every single week. Is that what, how you think it works all the time? Yeah. Right now. That's what Coast. the summers are like, right? That's what it looks like on TV. <laughs> huh. <laughs> that's, that, by the way, is how the East Coast looks to those people right in Southern California. <laughs> there's a blizzard all the time. Well, it's you can't drive two miles. Sunny here. <laughs> 
Shouldn't it always be snowy there? Yeah, that, I mean, that's what it seems like. <laughs> I grew up in Seattle. I know about inclement weather. Um, but yeah, that's true. You'd probably just have to compromise. I mean, you're just in a situation where like those are your choices. Like, you yeah, don't... or discuss with the group. Hey, guys, look, let, maybe let's all, okay, we can proxy five cards per deck now. Let's all raise the power level a little bit. Wouldn't that be fun? So we don't have to spend money and we can see if we like it or not. And if you don't like it, you just stop proxying the cards and you play with the ones you already have. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, just find ways to make it work. It's a game that's so flexible. It's absurdly flexible. That's why I like it so much. If only people were just as flexible. Yeah. <laughs> I think but that's, so it goes. <laughs> I think that's what we keep saying, right? Is be flexible, kind of. Yeah, be flexible. Don't be get, open. Yeah, don't get entitled. Don't get hurt yeah. by by things that. You know, it's a big long life we're gonna, all going to live. You know, ideally, and you're playing a game that you want to enjoy. So try to look at the larger scope of things rather than like in that moment, this person did this and I will never forgive them. Unless it was like the sixth time they've done it and you've told them stop doing it. Yeah, it was the sixth time that they've Armageddon to you then. No, I'm just kidding. Still be flexible. Yeah, and put Counterspell in your deck. Okay. <laughs> Playing with Strangers. Now this is one that Josh and I are pretty familiar with. Um, we go to GPs every year. We'll go to local game stores, play in pre-releases and all this stuff. And the reason I like pre-releases so much is because they have that mentality that we've been sort of harking, har, harkening, harping toward, on, harping on, and harkening towards this entire episode, which is the flexibility thing. Which is everyone goes to a pre-release for the most part to have a nice, enjoyable time, to have fun, to experience a new product, play Magic for the reasons they love to play Magic. Um, but a lot of times that's not the case. I think I, I would be surprised if you know, raise of hands. Uh, who here has not heard of, oh, yeah, that person at our LGS, don't, yeah, you just kind of stay away. Or uh, they're ruining it for a lot of other people. Like, I think a lot of us have heard of these people, seen them. Maybe they're our friends. Maybe it's you. So playing with strangers isn't necessarily the easiest thing to do. And I think the big thing is, like, conversation is really important, but also just knowing that you're kind of rolling the dice when you play with random people. So to not take it as hurtfully or as seriously if it doesn't go to what you're planning or what you're expecting yeah that's there's two things i would say because there's two sides to the coin there's the people who already play at the lgs they probably know each other mm -hmm. then there's the new people coming into the lgs who are looking for people to play with and they they're new so they don't know the people so from the new person side i like what you said about like you should manage your expectations you should have expectations that like you know, you don't know what you're getting into. You're going in with strangers. They don't, it's not like a friend group, right? So yeah. they don't necessarily owe you the same things that, you know, your buddies do. Uh -huh. So you need to go in there understanding that on in general, LGS uh, level of competition is going to be higher. They're going to have a sort of a higher threshold for what they'll allow their decks to do as far as going combo and mm -hmm. going, going ham. And, but the people at the LGS already, like you need to realize something too, which is that, you have to play commander with other people, other human beings. And the more people that play commander, the better it is for you because you live in a world with more options for you to play more often. Sure. And so the new people coming in that you don't know, you need to be cultivating those people. And so those are the people that like, maybe they require a little more handholding or whatever, yeah. but that you need to be maybe nicer to them than you would be to somebody even that you know, because them coming back to the shop a lot is good for you. It's good for your shop. It's good for your community. It's good for your meta. That's a person that can you can play with often. And if you treat them correctly at the beginning, they're going to come back and that's a boon. Like in general, having more people available to play magic with is better for you. Yeah. You know, don't be afraid if you're a more experienced player to Kadama's reach out. Cultivate Kadama's reach out <laughs> a better relationship because I mean like we all were there at some point we were that new player for the first time we built a deck online we went and we bought the singles we put it together and it was just garbage but it was super fun to do when you wanted to play for the first time and like those I think there's a whole psych study about how first uh, impressions have a much longer lasting effect than anything else and sometimes a first impression can sour an entire relationship and it takes a lot of time to overcome what that first impression was. So those first impressions, like that player coming into play for the very first time, even if it's at the table of five and three of the other players couldn't give, couldn't care less, if you're that person that is, you know, wanting to, that senses it, then 
don't i'm not saying that this is your burden as a player this is the social expectation or whatever but you could make a huge difference in that player's life because you decided to be like hey man like your deck's awesome you lost real badly do you want to try one of mine out you know or like hey like let's play one-on-one -on -one. or like let me give you some advice or whatever and i've seen that happen at pre-releases so many times and i've seen the kids faces light up or even like parents faces light up being like wow that's so cool the community here is really caring or at least this person reached out or the person like, hey, do you have trades or whatever? And I think actually to your point of you want that person to come back, per people that love to trade in stores, people that love to, to compare decks, talk about cards, like those are your absolute best friends because there's no more excited player than the very new one that has cards and wants other cards to be trading with, at least from my perspective. I would even say like one of the great things we have in Commander that they don't even have this option in the other formats is like in a game, you could be like destroying things that are pointed at that other player. You could actually be like subtly right. helping them in the game, right? Big brother. Yeah, just a little bit, but you might make it so that instead of getting knocked out really early, they manage to limp through a little bit longer and have more fun and- While limping. Yeah, but I mean, you know, if they come in with a weaker deck, they're probably not gonna win, but you could make it so that they get some things going maybe. You yeah. Could, you help them out a little bit, maybe at the cost of even you having a chance to win that game. But just think, and like you said, the dividends that it can pay over the long term are so good for you. Yeah. You know, having another person that is in the community that in so many ways can benefit you. I think a big thing too is bullying is still a very real problem in the world. And a lot of times politics and the things that we talk about helping you get an edge in this game can lead to a sense of that, which is like, it wasn't just that I was being teamed up on by the creatures at the table, but the people were actually teaming up on me yeah. in person. They, they kept saying these things that weren't true and I couldn't defend myself. And then when I did, they shut me down. They said it was my fault. You know, like all the classic signs of what bullying can do to someone can also happen in this game. And I don't think that's, that is something I'm very adamant about. I don't think that culture should at all have any place in Commander because like Josh said, what happens at the table should stay at the table. But at the same time, you don't want to do it in such an oppressive and awful way that the person you're doing it to has like emotional trauma or is scarred or just doesn't like it anymore because of an unfortunate experience like that. I think that's where the quote unquote problem people in LGSs can come from is the person that cares more about their winning in that than anything else. And they're playing a format that isn't necessarily best fit for that. Maybe that person would be better off just playing competitive one-on-one, -on -one, in which case you can be as spiky as you want and the other player can't necessarily be like, you know what, you should stop being, you should stop trying to win so hard in this format that's about winning. Commander, I don't think is a format about winning. You guys did the stats episode. What's the average number or percentage of games you a person wins? Not too high. Well, I mean, technically 25%. Yeah. So one <laughs> in four chance, like anyone that's a true spike try hard, you tell them, oh, sorry, every game, 25% chance of winning. When they're trying to get their win percentage to 70%, you know, like that's, the Commander isn't focused about winning necessarily. I think overall for a lot of players, it's about having a good time for whatever you identify with as a, you know, as a human. Yeah, I hesitate to say what Commander's for. I think the important thing is to make sure that whatever you think it's for, that everybody else at the table is on the same mm -hmm. wavelength. So competitive players do want to win every game and they're playing combo decks and they're trying to win on turn three or four. They're not doing it wrong unless they're at a table where the other players are not there. They're yeah. trying to have fun and hang out. And I think that's the biggest point is like, hey, listen, if you want to win 70% of your games, you should be playing with other people who want to win 70% of their games and you guys can battle it out with your super competitive combo decks. Totally yeah. cool. Uh, Don't go pub stomping over here though. Yeah, that's the word it becomes a problem is like the new player comes up to that table. And like, if the new player comes to the table and that's how you're playing, I would, I would warn them. I'd be like, listen. Yeah, that's a good point. This is, we're gonna be playing like super competitive decks and you know, we're liable to do some infinite combo on turn three or four. You're ha welcome to join the game, but you know, I'm just, war I'm just warning you that's the type of game we're playing here. Yeah. It might not be the type of game you've seen on game nights or whatever. Manage some expectations. Yeah, and I, I think that's totally fair. You're up front, you know? Mm -hmm. Then the person knows what to expect and then if they say, yeah, I wanna try it, sure. Or maybe they go, oh, maybe I should go play with those people over there. Yeah. Uh, and that's and both of those things are fine because everybody knew what was happening. It's this when the expectations are incorrect and they sit down because yeah, we totally get you know emails of like well we get both sides. People that go to LGS have a great time, are so happy. You know I we'll get uh, comments and emails where people are like just wanting to let you know I won my first game of Commander right. at the shop. Uh, I've been going for two weeks and I just finally won a game and it felt so good. But then there's also people who are like I went to the shop one time and people were such jerks that I never want to go back. Yeah. That's the worst. Like you don't want you you just do not want your shop to be the place somebody went into and they don't ever want to go back. And that's partially like your fault. Right. 
Like, if it's a local it, game store, that does belong to you, the community, in a way. And if you're someone out there that it actually owns a game store, then I think you do actually have a burden to try and make it not that climate, unless it's somehow making you the most amount of money, which would very much surprise me. Well, it could be the shop owner that goes over and goes, hey, just FYI, yeah, so I those mean, guys are really competitive. Yeah. You know, maybe, do you want to play a game? I'll play a game with you. You mm -hmm. know, what do you got? You know, I don't know, unless you've got a turn four combo deck, you know. Some of the best shop owners I've ever met are the ones that will play in events if they have the chance to, or, you know, like. Or fill in. Yeah, or and like the best shop owners, honestly, are the ones who are like, hey man, look, here's some bulk rares that they match with their colors. I thought you might like this. I've seen yeah. so many people's lives change in that instant to be like, wow. Cause I mean, like, I feel like most players for Commander aren't ones that just came in by themselves. They're shepherded in somehow by a friend, by a podcast, by some other experience that brings them into the format. So it's not like you're just like, hey, here's this huge gap, jump over it. But like, let's build a bridge together and I'll walk you over. Maybe you can jump over it later kind of thing. Yeah. Um, this is the same thing goes for Grand Prix as well. Except I would say, I would say Grand Prix are a much easier place to be like, hey guys, what's the power level? What do you guys have to do? There's just okay, so, I'm gonna go somewhere else. There's just so many people that you're gonna be able to find. Yeah, you might yeah. go into a shop and it's like, that's there's those people playing commander and you kind of have to either play at their level or not but it's good to know what their level is mm -hmm. uh before you step into it you know yeah what do you got what do you guys got going on here you know on the scale of one to ten are we nine ten are we i've seen six, people seven? too that have friends that go with them that no, their decks aren't on that level and they sit and watch and it's like hey let you let's play a game with us these watchers because we can't we don't want to play on this level or this isn't our style or whatever and i've always found that to be a fun experience too all right, the last segment, and this sort of ties it all together, I entitled it, Let's Talk Humans. Because I think the biggest part of this whole discussion revolves around a lot about what you know about yourself and your comfort level with yourself too, to be able to interact in these situations. Because this is, I'm not gonna lie, like as a gamer growing up, someone that had limited social interaction in high school and middle school, I really only burst out of my shell and my bubble in college Gaming does not lead to a lot of social, I guess, experience. And that's one of the best ways to also know who you are is because if you're just by yourself the whole time, you're not really looking in the mirror. Or you're not really being challenged to be like, wait, how would I respond to this situation? Because you kind of control the settings of your environment. Right. As soon as you start introducing new pieces, new people into the equation, all of a sudden you have different people that are going to be mirrors to you or show you a reflection of how you react when something happens. And it's a hard process, but it's one that I think is really important for humans to do in general. And it's one we naturally do over time. It's just one that gamers tend to do a lot less because we are the kinds of people that confine ourselves to our room more than often than not, to our solo experiences, to our computers. We've already seen how toxic some of the chats can be in, in multiplayer games. Like that's, I think, a direct result of not sort of having the experience of doing social stuff and being able to hide behind a name. So many other parts and things go into it. But like the colors we play, the people that we are, these are all things I think are really important to understanding who we are so that we can better enter ourselves into a group and find that balance, if that makes sense. Because when I was a kid and I played Pokemon for the first time, if I could have chose, Josh, between Squirtle, Charmander, or Bulbasaur, who do you think I would have chosen? Charmander. I chose Squirtle. Okay. The and cutest? Yeah, I like the yeah. color blue a lot. Yeah. I thought Squirtle was the cutest. There was Pokemon blue and red, so I could have definitely have just literally gone red, but I was told my mom, I want blue. And I was thinking about it, I was like, man, I totally would have been the Charmander kid, but why wasn't I? And it's because, you know, back then, that's just who the person I was. And like after doing this whole thing in New Zealand for six months, I had a lot of time to think about it. I was like, maybe I am still kind of a Squirtle guy, but Charmander is something that like represented me in a different way, or it's something that I was growing, growing into in high school or middle school. But ultimately, like when I really look back at my core, I was more of this kind of person, this kind of player. And so that was just something that was a really silly comparison to think about as a 31-year-old adult. <laughs> but it was something I was like, man, that's true. Why, why did I love this so much more? And why have I sort of attached myself to this name, even though I, I deep down know in my heart that a lot of the times it's not true at all. Mm -hmm. So that sort of self-recognition um, is something that I think is really important to this whole discussion, which is like, who are you? Why do you play the colors you play? Why do you play the kind of decks you want to play? And that way, if someone's like, hey, can you change your decks up? Can you change your play style? It's like, I can change things and still stay true to myself. And I know how I want to have fun. So this is not this is more of a fun challenge for me instead of someone trying to say, stop doing that. You know, we talked a long time ago about how like the Vile Smasher Thrasios deck, when I built it, I didn't think it was like my style right. of deck at all. Cause it's like Vile Smasher does random damage. And then it's my favorite deck now and it's not, I didn't think I would like it, 
so you don't always even know what you would like. Yeah. So a lot of these, you know, for those people out there who are the ones where the play group's going like, hey, we don't really like mm. that deck you play all the time and, you know, it's not it's not making it fun for the rest of us. Instead of reacting like Angrily, you could see it as a challenge and an ability and a, or time and place where you have the chance to like broaden your horizon a little. And maybe you'll find out that, yeah, pistachio ice cream is great. Yeah. I mean, maybe you've just never really tried it or you haven't tried it in years. You know, I didn't like spicy food until I got to college. Never ate Blasphemy. spicy food. Never ate it at all. Hated it. I was like, why would you eat something that hurts you? Oh, it's, 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 it doesn't taste like anything. <laughs> got to college. Got hung over a couple of times, <laughs> ate some spicy food, and was like, what have I been doing? I just stopped and barred myself from experiencing this because I found some discomfort in it. And I think the areas of discomfort that we put ourselves in willingly are the ones that are gonna make us grow the fastest and learn the most about ourselves. It doesn't mean that I could have been, I could have walked away from that station and been like, I still like spicy food, I just don't prefer it. Right. But right. at least I know more about myself in the process and that adventurous spirit, that hungover spirit <laughs> that wanted to have those buffalo wings. <laughs> And blue cheese. Buffalo wings when that was the spicy food? I mean, look, it's a nice intro spicy yeah, that's food. That's true. That's a good point. That's a good point. Well, you've come a long way, Charlie Brown. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Cut to me dying over <laughs> Dragon Week or whatever we did for that time. Ghost oh, my God. Song. Ghost pepper, yeah. Ham froze. Uh, Miss Ram froze, that's what it is. Yes. Oh, no, no. It was um, Old Grumpy Marks. The guy from Old Grumpy Marks. Yeah. I'm literally sweating just thinking about it. We should do that again. That was fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so my fun. stomach is still not happy about it, though. Oh, my gosh. That was a really... I think we had to record more podcasts that day, too. Wasn't it one of those marathon days we had? Yeah, we. I think we did three that day. It was day. for Commander uh, 2017. If you don't know what we're talking about, Murph will show it on screen right now, but we um, did one episode for like our preview card for yeah Commander 2017 mm -hmm. where it's like some bone we took spoonfuls dragon. of ghost pepper uh, hot sauce. And then we did the episode. Consumed it and then did the episode. It was like hot ones. You just sat there and just kept eating it the whole time. And I was like, all right, fine, I'll do one more. Oh, man. Such <laughs> you a... were sweating a lot. It was pretty funny. Yeah, it was great. Um, <laughs> well, I've been training for that moment my whole life. So, <laughs> yeah, it's all been adding up to this. Um, one last thing that I wanted to talk about today is what I call the human wavelength theory. I like this. Is this a real thing? Yeah, did you it's, call? It's, it's something I started thinking about and ruminating about when I was on the South Island of New Zealand. Okay. I was living with one of my fellow actors named Chen. And he is, I don't know if you guys are into astrology at all. And if you're not, it's totally fine. I, it's just an easier way to convey this idea. So he's a cancer. So cancers are born, I think, in July-ish. They are crabs. They're meant to be more sort of reserved. They have a shell, an outer hard shell. They sort of hide who they're, they, they keep themselves protected, I think is the general idea of a cancer. And I, in astrology, Western astrology, am an Aries. Aries are creatures like rams. They run into things, they're stubborn, hot-headed. So you would think that a cancerous crab and a bull-headed Aries would not get along. And at first, Chen was one of those guys where at, at first it was like, so great to meet you, honeymoon period, and very quickly was like, okay, I don't jive with this guy at all. The way he acts, the way he, his energy is, it throws me off, I don't like it. And then we were forced to live together for a whole month. And what I realized is that Something that I do as a younger brother, uh, as someone that is an actor and sort of the person that wants validation and someone who's like, nice job, Jimmy, you did good, is that I would often force myself to fit situations or to fit what I want, thought other people wanted me to do. And when I was living in Chen, I realized that there was something that like I didn't need to do because when I tried to do that with someone that was definitely of a different energy and sort of wavelength than myself, it just made me more anxious, made me more pent up, and I felt like I was just straining all the time mentally. Um, and so the wavelength theory is that every human, I think, vibrates at a different wavelength. So you could be someone that, vib if you're watching, you'll see me do with some of my fingers. You could be someone that vibrates very frequently, or you can be someone that vibrates very slowly, and also the length and the height at which you vibrate could be sure, very different. Sure, you could vibrate just here, or yeah, you could be like and it could this. be slow here, it could be fast here, and I think everyone has their own sort of this is how I cruise through life, mm -hmm. and that can change throughout your life as well. You know, maybe when you're a kid, you had a lot more energy, so it was more frequent. But what I realize is that we always find connection with other people when you get into a groove with them. Like we've had so much conversation back and forth, it doesn't take long for us to figure out that groove, and it's that. It's like sort of like if two were, uh, lengths were going at the same time, it's where they meet up. Right. And that's where like the special moments happen. Where it's like, oh man, that was such a great moment we had. Or like last night was so much fun because of X, Y, and Z. When this happened and everyone like reached that fever pitch, I think everyone sort of felt that in the commander group where it's like, that was so memorable. Well, <laughs> like when Craig, uh, I think one of my favorites is when Craig flipped over the piles and he lost everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> like that's one of those moments where everyone just happened to be on the same wave like at the exact same time right and it doesn't mean that you have to stay there or force yourself to be there you can split but you're you all you will no matter what eventually meet back up with the other person so for me the human wavelength theory is that it's not up to you it's not it's not a good idea i think to be the kind of person that wants to adjust it or be so steadfast and being like i can never like be with this person and play with them because of x y and z because there will be points where you find uh, a shared thing. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that are really important and that it's fine to not necessarily be compatible with people. And it's totally fine to want to be more compatible with people and figuring out those moments and focusing on those as opposed to the moments where you're not really jiving with each other else, each other person. So that's the human wavelength theory. I think everyone in life is vibrating at these different things and, and sort of cruising through life at the different times. And the special moments are when you link up with people but it's not something that you have to force or think is n completely necessary to happen like frequently for you to be a good friend with someone. Because I now consider Chen someone who I probably only link up with on that weird theory like a few times, not as frequently as like some of my best, best friends out here, but I still now consider him one of my best friends because it helps me, you know, it helps find the yin yang sort of balance between two people when it happens. It helps you sort of stay true to yourself too right because you yeah. realize oh this is my wavelength i just stay here everything's gonna be fine yeah exactly and like i don't need to force myself to be something else that i'm not if someone's unhappy with me i can still be me and figure out a way to make it work i got a lot more spiritual since i've come back from new zealand i was like when i saw this on the paper i was like i have never heard of this so i'm glad <laughs> that you made it up because that means that it's not something i should have heard of exactly but now you have and yeah. listeners you have too you're coming up with your whole own theories yeah, I mean, when you spend that much time with someone and other people, it's sort of the natural conversation topic or the natural thought process that you go to, at least for me as an actor, because it's a very cerebral thing. And you're always trying to, you know, I'm trying to be someone else when I'm right. on screen. What right. does that mean? Yeah. So when you're with other people and you see how different everyone is, how everyone operates in their own ways, it gives you a lot more time to stop and be like, why am I this way? Why are they that way? And not doing it in an accus accusatory pointy fingers kind of way. Yeah, yeah, it's an analysis of because it might be in your toolbox later that you have to use it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, cool. actually, uh, side story again. Michael Pena, great mm -hmm. actor. Mm -hmm. I watched an interview with him, and he says he gets a lot of his characters from watching documentaries and have that have very real eccentric, weird people in them. And he'll be like, you know what, that guy, I like him with that for this character, and he'll draw from real experiences. So there's lots to be learned there. Pretty cool. All right, to the listeners, what are your playgroups like? Do you think there's something that can be done about it? Or do you think it's impossible to make things worse? work? Not it's worse. definitely not possible to make things worse. You can always make things worse. I, I will say, you know, nothing's impossible, but I do prescribe to the theory or the philosophy that like, sometimes it's okay. It's totally it's okay. It's not gonna work. Totally and that's okay. nobody's fault. Take the anger and the emotion out of it. Yeah. You know, but mom and dad are, still love each other very yeah. much. <laughs> There's a lot of times where it can work though, where it's just yeah. a little bit of communication will make people realize things are like, oh, I had no idea you even felt that way. Yeah, yeah I can totally sit blah, blah, blah. Right. It's kind of like uh, like a, a squeaky or like a, a, a casket or something. Is a casket the right? A gasket? Gasket. A gasket. It's like, and it's just one little hole and just someone needs to put a little putty there. Yeah. Right. It's just like one small thing could make the entire thing flow perfectly. But until you get to that issue and you figure what it out what it is, you don't want to be dancing around it, you know, have eight people all like hammering away at it, trying to fix it at the same time. You know, sometimes it's a very simple solution and communication is that. All right. If you want to support this show, Extra Turns, Game Nights, any of our content, it's really, really easy because you're a magic player. You're going to buy magic cards. Mm -hmm. If you go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone, when you do that, you're first of all, accomplishing your main goal, get magic cards. And you're just getting thrown in for gravy as free value, the support of our content. Yeah. We really, really appreciate people who use the affiliate link. It means a ton to us and it super helps us out. Yeah, it 100% does. And of course, Ultra Pro as well helps us out quite a bit. And that's why we're always happy to mention their products, use their products on our show as well. And hey, look, you look cool when you have a cool play mat and cool sleeves and cool deck boxes and magic Relic cards. tokens. Relic Those tokens. Cool dice. Yeah. Yeah, they got a lot of really cool stuff. Yeah, and it's all across the spectrum too. So let's say you just want one specific thing. Well, Ultra Pro's got you covered there. So next time you're at your local game store trying to find a new play group or trying to escape from your old one, pick up some product. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. And it's another card game. 
Yeah, I've seen um, ads for this, but I haven't tried it. It is really fun. I think you would like it a lot. It's a it's a new card game uh, designed by Richard Garfield. Mm -hmm. uh, it's at Fantasy Flight Games, FFG. They've done a lot of stuff. Now, this is a physical card game, right? It's a physical it's card not, game. Um, it's not online. We're used to like saying that, and then it ends up being a digital card game. Yeah. But this is like a real... It's called Keyforge. Um, and the premise of it is very simple. Basically, you have a deck. You're drawing cards out of it. And you're playing creatures. It's similar to kind of Hearthstone, where you can have creatures on the flank. You have artifacts, and you have like sort of one-off sorcery spells as well. Um, and each deck, there are seven total guilds right now. As I think that's, I don't know if that's the right term. And each deck is completely and entirely random. So in, it's you know when you buy a booster pack, you have yeah. eight commons, three uncommons, or whatever, yeah. and, and a rare. So each pack or a mythic, each time you there are no boosters in Keyforge, and there's there's well, only decks. There's only decks. So you go to the store, you see the three colors or the three guilds that are on the deck. You don't know what's in it. You buy it, and then it's going to be an assortment of cards out of the set. So there's like a 360-card set out right now. And it's going to be potentially amazing. It's going to be maybe just good. Maybe it won't be even that good at all in the same way that the booster pack can sometimes be incredible or not incredible. You know how you sometimes play a mini masters with boosters? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like that, but with a deck. And those are the only decks. You, there's no deck building in this game, which is really interesting. Oh, so you can't ever take two of the different decks you've bought and combine because them? Because each deck has their own unique QR code. So the way that I think the tournament system works is you bring your three best decks that you've bought, and the other player can ban one of them. And they can check the validity of it because they can look at the QR code and make sure that your deck is exactly that. So you always uh. have access to the other player's deck list as well. So it's this really interesting format where instead of buying a booster, you're just buying decks. And sometimes you have really cool decks that happen to synergize in this particular way. Or these three colors you know you really like, so you want to buy that deck because you, hopefully you'll get something in this combination. So I played against Matt with like three or four different decks, and it was really, really fun because... I, once you play a deck once, you're like, okay, I kind of get what my deck's trying to do. So the next time you play it, you can start structuring the way you play around it. Mm -hmm. So the deck comes with its own style and everything, but it just happens to be randomized. Oh, sounds really cool. Yeah. Well, anything by Richard Garfield, I think, uh, has yep. a good chance of being awesome. And the way you win is you accumulate these like points, and then you turn the points to flip over three discs, or you're forging keys. Oh, uh, that's right. And there's ways to steal those from other people. There's a way to take it away. There's a way to make it cost more. All sorts of different little things. So it's it's interesting. It's really fun. All right, cool. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Keyforge. Keyforge. Maybe I can get together with you and Matt and try it out one of these yeah, days. Yeah, he, he would love that. Uh, some other guys who develop games. In fact, they've got a card game. It's called it's true. Battle Bosses. Uh, I'm talking about Alex Kessler and Ben Bateman. And they also host our sister podcast, which is the Masters of Modern. They talk about the modern format and all things competitive magic. You can find them on uh, Twitter, at the MMCast. You can also find them on YouTube because they do video content now. If you just oh. type Masters of Modern into the search bar there, they're going to pop up. Or they're right next to us at collected.company. And the new awesome thing that's happened while I've been gone, our editor for the show is Joss Murphy. Murph. That's right, Murph. Yeah, You're thanks, doing a great Murph. Job. Thank you so much. And it's great to finally be around everyone and get to interface with them and get to know everyone better. They're all awesome people. So make sure you thank Murph as well. And, of course, special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer at Living Cards MTG on Twitter, who does the intro and outro graphics as with this one as well? Yep, this Thousand one Year well. Storm. Jeffrey. A thousand Year Storm. That's how, many, that's how long I'm going away next time. For a thousand years? Yeah, that's my next project is a thousand years. Wow. When I come back though, it's gonna be amazing. You're, you're gonna have a really long beard. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> Don't you dare play Cyclonic Rift against me. Never. Guy is cradle. More like the most broken piece of crap in the game! Ma! You know what this game needs? More banned cards. More of them! I force of will that! Ha 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 ha! Take that, sucker. What are you gonna discard? Uh, I pay full cost.